All right, let's get started. Let me get the lights adjusted and whatnot. So, and then it will, there we go. All right, one more lecture and then it's turkey time, right? All right, so welcome back to the Freshman Engineering Seminar. We are down to the wire. It's week 13. So we, just so everybody's clear on the calendar, okay, so we have a seminar today and then we have Thanksgiving break. We'll have one more lecture on week 14 when we come back, and then week 15 we will have our final exam. So we're not going to meet for final exam week, we're just going to have our exam in class during the last lecture. Everybody okay with that? All right. Okay, um, let's go through a few quick announcements and then we'll get through our agenda so that we can uh, expedite your uh, turkey eating process uh, starting next week. So. Uh, announcements, we, uh, don't forget we've got our meetings as usual. Um, Steel Bridge meetings are every other Monday uh, at 7 and EL 101. And we've got SAME, ASCE, and then the Mechanicals uh, meeting every other Tuesday and every other Monday, respectively. Now that's for this semester. One thing I'll point out, next semester these meeting times might change because they do their best to schedule meeting times around classes and labs. And since next semester it's a whole different set of classes, whole different set of labs, the meeting times might change, but they do their best to schedule the meeting times uh, around lab schedules to try and accommodate uh, as many people uh, as possible. Now, one more thing, don't forget, uh, SAME ASCE is conducting an apparel sale. They're, they're selling things like polos and pullovers and, and, and quarter zips, I think, and things like that. Um, this is a link right here in this uh, PowerPoint. This is going to get posted. Uh, online. I believe in the last email I sent to the class, I put the link for the, uh, for the sale uh, in the email. Um, everything's online, so you can use a credit card, debit card. Uh, you can also uh, write a check and throw it into the mailbox in the old engineering building. Uh, and they've got a whole uh, host of stuff there, so you might want to check that out. Uh, and we are getting back uh, on schedule with our quizzes, so quiz three will be made available later today, but it's not going to be due next Friday because you all are going to be getting over uh, all your uh, turkey and whatnot. That's going to be due the Friday we get back, so that's December 2nd. So don't, don't forget about quiz 13. All right, anybody have any questions? All right, let's get in uh, on our agenda. Now today our main speaker is, uh, is Jason Jackson, and I know we've got some folks in here who are interested in mechanical engineering. We've got some folks that are interested in electrical engineering. But, um, you know, one person we haven't really uh, had anybody talk about or one topic we haven't had any discussion about is bridges. And, and I am a bridge engineer and I don't care if you're interested in computer science or, or uh, electronics or mechanics or anything. I'm a bridge engineer and by God you are going to learn something about bridges. So, um, Jason is a, a construction engineer with Kokosing Construction. He's going to talk a little bit about some, uh, some really cool bridge projects that uh, he's been involved in. But before that, we've got uh, our faculty introduction. Uh, as usual, this week we have a mechanical engineer, Dr. Sardar Sadiq. He's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what he does uh, here at Marshall. So first off, let's everybody give a round of applause for Dr. Sadiq. Good morning, guys. Is it good morning or good afternoon? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> good afternoon. So my name is Sardar Sadiq. I believe everybody maybe in the meantime you came to know my name. And um, I have been here since August 2014. My major area is advanced manufacturing system and when I appointed in uh, Marshall, another new dimension I have added, it is called additive manufacturing. So let's have an introduction about myself. I have my PhD from National University of Singapore in 2006. Currently, this university, according to world ranking, 
wealth in the world. My career objective, I have to engage with the students and motivate the student towards highly talented mechanical engineers. Then I would like to produce some exemplary service for the students and contribute significantly for the department objectives and how we can this our target to establish mechanical engineering at Marshall Engineering. Ultimately, the last goal and least it is I have to produce some scholarly research either individually or collaborative approach among our faculty as well as other universities in USA. Here I have given a just a list of my qualifications, what I have. So far I have 14 years teaching experience in mechanical engineering. I have also industrial experience, then um, to develop lab and effective teamwork, academics, scientists, researchers throughout, I have some connections. Also I have connections with government agencies. So far, with the based on my qualification, this is my experience. So far, I have taught uh, in uh, USA four num universities. Number one, I st start from University of Texas El Paso. This is one of the pioneers for development of additive manufacturing. Then second, uh, I started in uh, Southern Mississippi University. Before I joined here, I was employed in Central Michigan University, that is another uh, big university, and it has well established mechanical discipline. And on the basis of those experience, I did have in USA plus Canada, in Malaysia, Singapore. Now I am trying to build up my career as a mechanical engineering specialist and uh, academia. This is maybe a, a very interesting uh, issue that so far I have started to teach here in 2014. I have now fourth semester. And every semester I am teaching the new courses as mechanical engineering is the new discipline. And 11 courses so far I, in the spring 2017, I am going to teach manufacturing processes with the collaboration of RCBI, then mechanical engineering lab one, design and analysis of energy system, So this is my so far contribution in here in terms of teaching. This is my research interest. So at the mo topmost, I have now interest in 3D printed glass fiber reinforced tooth retainer, then additive manufacturing, electron beam melted aerospace material. All are based on now focus is the 3D printed product plus nano manufacturing. In my collaborative approach, in the last semi, uh, summer, we have done extensive research with RCBI and Northrop uh, Grumman, who are the major supplier of aerospace product in USA. And uh, we found there are a lot of implication of 3D printing to produce the product which we can produce without any tooling. In traditional or conventional manufacturing processes, it requires any tool or dies. But if we are going to use the 3D printing or additive manufacturing, we can reduce the cost 50 percent by not to using any tools or dies. 
we have li like the normal printer, we give the command, it is start to print, we can get the print out. In the additive manufacturing process, it is also the same way, maybe you have to produce the layer around whatever the requirement, 800 layers, 1000, then 1015, you can increase the layer, the product will be the gradually larger and larger. So, let us see what is manufacturing. So, in the manufacturing system, you can see there are a lot of uh, engineering discipline. I do not want to uh, uh, regret anybody or something, just uh, or dominate mechanical engineering with the others, because from the history of human being, they have the nature to produce something and survive in the world. Anyway, they have to produce something, either for eating, living, or be for betterness of the life, they have to produce something. And if you want to produce something, whether it is civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or computer engineering, it does not matter. You have to start from the some materials first to produce something. So, this is called manufacturing to add value to the items or products. So, in this case, you can see the development. You start from background, role of mechanical engineers, then CNC machining. This is one of the advanced technology, 3D modeling. Now, from this 3D modeling ad or additive manufacturing, you have to develop your curriculum, research and calculations. So, in additive manufacturing, most challenges now, the main purpose is design. If you are producing the design of any item, it is going to be adjusted, validated in the printer and it can change the dimension or shape. So, this is the major challenge that you have to maybe make hundreds of trials to get a final product or item. So, I have produced some uh, item for you to visualize. It is an orthopedic tooth retainer. We have given around 10 trials. Still, we are at the infant stage. We can't reach our goal. So, in that manner, if we think about these uh, manufacturing processes, we can go in advanced manufacturing system, CNC machining, and it is automated process, and whole process is based on requirements, portfolio, conceptual design, product engineering, manufacturing engineering, simulation, build and produce, test qualify or quality control, sales distribution, maintenance and repair. Ultimately, you have disposal or recycling. Then, if you conclude all of your investment, subtract the, you already spend for the production, then it will be the total benefits, law or either profit or loss. So, this is the usual process we are doing right now for the production of any item in machine shop. We have all the machine shop here in uh, our premise now. If we do not have, we are going to use some other facilities at RCBI. So, this is a uh, called FANUC controller, program keys, operation keys, everything all together. We can use the program, then Is there any pointer? Yes. Uh, right there. Oh, right there. Sorry. So, machine unit, when it is uh, reading the program, that program is initiated within the processing equipment, then start to produce the item. So, this is the usual, uh, like very basic or simple program for standard drilling. If you want to make a hollow shape or hole, 
It requires CAD CAM also, which is the fundamental also for additive manufacturing. Ultimately, we have to see the product life cycle using the CAD CAM, and this is the whole product life cycle using the design process plus manufacturing processes. So, first of all, we have to get the necessity of the product, then go for design. Ultimately, you can produce the design for this, then go for process. Ultimately, you can go for marketing when you are shipping, packaging, quality control, production. Then, if it is not validated or satisfied, again you have to go through the process, it is called analysis. So, change the design, change the product shape, then you can again go for trial and error method to make the ultimate design and confirmation of the product shape. My research interest already I mentioned, I have to see the additive manufacturing facilities. We have right now three additive manufacturing equipment in room number EL109 and uh, it is an uh, on machine object 30, it is under operation. We are producing the item from that uh, machine. We have some other item, you can see this one also, one is for metallic, it is aerospace material bracket. So, let us see 3D printing or stereolithography, how we can start from beginning of 3D printing. Stereolithography, it is stands for STL, all design we have to make it the file name, it is called STL or stereolithography, then it will take the command or reading the command from the file. Ultimately, we can develop any shape by additive manufacturing. So, you can see there are thousands of items and this is the major challenge and currently the challenge of this additive manufacturing, they want to produce the very small item to very big item like a rocket or airplane or car whole body at a time. You do not have to operate several times or millions of components need to produce, then build a car or airplane or rocket. So, my interest, we are in West Virginia and um, this is from, uh, I have met one person or professor in um, Penn State University conference. He is from WB Tech and uh, I am very much interested that and very much uh, uh, impressed what they have, they are doing. They are now producing the whole airplane prototype. So, if they can, why not Marshall can do it? So, let us uh, do the approach of you know, our President Obama, we can do. So, this is our object uh, 30 prime printer, then materials we can use around 7 materials, it is thermoset and liquid beds and those are the items we have made trial and this is the item we tried in um, RCBI, it is metallic item for aerospace bracket. Those are the two new machines we have, maker robot. It is using the thermoplastics, using the filament and we have the lab. So far we have completed on mechanical engineering lab 2, we have completed 7 experiment, experiments using statics and dynamics con concept and uh, luckily we made it, we do not have any lab technician, but still we can do it. So, this is the fatigue test what we have done. And in spring 2017, we are going to run the lab, mechanical engineering lab 1, and we have several options up to 
12 experiment we can run within our facilities. And it is located at WESC or engineering building 1301 and 1303. We have the workshop and machine shop in WESC 1220 and engineering old main. Mechatronics lab we have or control lab it is uh, in level 2. So, ultimately as a mechanical engineers the objective should be how we can produce the item whether it is any daily essential or everyday item or mechanical item, civil engineering item or electrical engineering item whether we can produce it in safe and as an economic fashion, engineering economics should be applied to reduce the cost and maintain the standard. We have to develop our workers in safety for local industries. Now, we have to rejoice our this approach, flexible, innovative, um, troubleshooting approach in our workplace environment like we have a special metal, we have Fletcher then some other company Alcan. So, now whether we are going together apply this concept in diversified discipline I know in Huntington there are so many industries but they are not attached to in proper fashion. They are not related to mechanical engineering guideline. So, manufacturing is the best concept to contribute in Huntington and Marshall University and develop the locality. Let us contribute to society, society and local industries and develop ourselves. Thank you. Real quick, anybody have any questions for Dr. Sadiq? All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Get that, uh, yeah. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to our main speaker, uh, Jason Jackson, and he's going to talk about a, a very uh, passion project or a uh, passion topic of mine, highway bridges. Who's, who's got Dr. Sadiq's uh, items? Okay, uh, if you could just sort of pass those over on that side and he can come pick them up. All right. Floor is yours. Everybody give a round of applause for Mr. Jackson. So what time does this class end? You got about. 30 minutes, so if I go over by 30, we're good. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking with you guys, of course. I, as he said, I'm Jason Jackson. I'm a project engineer with Kikosi Construction. I uh, did my grad school with Greg uh, at W. We both worked with Dr. Barth. Um, we, uh, we had a lot of good times there, developed, developed a great friendship, so that's why I'm here. Um, this is the exact same presentation I gave last year. I apologize, guys. I did not have a chance to update it. Uh, we just got a new project up at Quarter H and, um, in Elkins, West Virginia. And uh, it's taken a lot of my time. So this is the first I've looked at it. Well, I looked at it five minutes before I left work. Um, and that's the first time I looked at it in a year. So we'll get through this together. But um, just give an overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, I'll give a quick overview of what uh, my educational background is, what I did for uh, grad school, um, and then we'll, I'll do some selling on Kikosi Construction Company since that's who I work for. Um, then I'll talk about a couple projects I did, and then um, I'll give some uh, professional advice for you guys. You guys are all freshmen, right? No? Got a mix of everybody? How many, how many civil engineers do we have or people that want to be civils? Quite a bit. How many people don't know what they want to do yet? So everybody in this room's decided then. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm not trying to sway anybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, educational background. I started off at uh, West Street Wesleyan College up in Buckhannon with a uh, bachelor's of science in physics with a minor in mathematics. Um, I went there to, to play football and uh, got involved in the 3-2 program and then switched over to physics just to get a four-year degree and then go on and get my master's at WU, um, which uh, worked out pretty well for me. But um, graduate research, um, 
see if I can remember this, Greg. It's been a while. Uh, lateral flange bending. Um, so when you're, uh, I looked at the stresses on construction loading of steel I beams uh, during construction. And what happens when you're, this is, uh, this is a bridge deck where they're getting ready to do their, they set their beams. So you know, the, well, this doesn't have a pier. Doesn't look like it, but uh, two abutments are up. They set their beams. They got their SIP pans on. They're getting ready to do their bridge deck pour. Uh, don't the bid well is not on that bridge, but this is over here is a bid well, which is for you for those of you who don't know, that's just a, a screed machine basically that has the two rollers on it that go back and forth and, and levels of concrete out on the bridge deck. Um, that thing has quite a bit of weight to it, especially when you get real wide. And when you set that bid well down on this bridge and put all that wet concrete on top of that bridge, it puts a lot of loading on this on this exterior girder. And what that girder wants to do, it wants to buckle and rotate out. So that's why you have cross frames um, um, on that girder to keep it uh, stable. Um, but uh, if I remember right, the, the equation for design on lateral flange mini stress is um, way, over. way over. Yeah. So we uh, we did some uh, a lot of FE modeling, a lot of computer programming um, to to model a bunch of bridges to try to figure out. Uh, equation that that um, was a little closer to the actual stress that's allowed. Um, um, spent a lot of time looking at dual monitors for two years, but um, we learned a lot. Are you actually? You mentioned you're going to pick up with that. Are you still going to? Yeah. Well, if any of you guys want to do a master's degree, it's a good place to start off. Anyway, Kikosi Construction Company, um, it's a company based out of Ohio, uh, established in 1953 by Bill Burgett. Um, it's a family-owned company. Family still owns it. Um, it's a great company to work for, uh, in my opinion. It's, um, it's a little different than most companies. You know, a lot of companies are corporations, especially your bigger ones like um, Keywit and some of those companies. Um, so you get that family-owned feel, you know, people that want to take care of you. Um, they know who you are. Um, and they do different things to just make you feel safe. Um, uh, their corporate headquarters are in Westerville, Ohio. Um, we have offices all over Ohio and West Virginia, the Columbus, Charleston, West Virginia, Sheboygan, Michigan, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Elyria, uh, Mansfield, Ohio, and Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and we reach out to projects in Indiana and Pennsylvania as well. I think the Kikosin is the largest uh, contractor based out of the state of Ohio um, and we're usually top 50 in the, in the nation um, in construction. Um, in multiple divisions, uh, we have a high, heavy highway division, which that's the group I work for, um, do uh, roads and bridges. Um, and then uh, heavy industrial, you know, they work on their, their sewer plants, wastewater treatment plants. Um, then we have our own asphalt, asphalt division in Ohio. We don't compete in West Virginia with asphalt. I don't know if any of you guys heard the lawsuit recently against West Virginia Paving, but um, there's a reason we don't compete in West Virginia. Um, uh, one thing that we do that's unique within the company, we have our own equi equipment division. You know, a lot of contractors, um, trying to think of example, like Turner, for example, they're a building contractor. They just manage construction. They don't actually own a lot of equipment or manage the people. Uh, they hire a bunch of subs and manage those subs to do the work. We self self-perform majority of our work, um, so that involves having our own equipment, and that's a that's a PC 2000 with the, the rock truck below it. Um, I'll get to play with some of those here in the, in the spring, hopefully. It'll be my first time around, so that's exciting. Um, much as I like bridges, the big equipment's fun, too. Um, but yeah, so we have all our own equipment. We have our own trucking company that moves all our equipment all over, so it, it's kind of, it's a big uh, organization working together, which is a little bit different than most companies. Um, and then we had the Marine Division, which is out of Sheboygan, Michigan. And those are the guys that get to do all the fun stuff, go to the Bahamas and um, dredge lakes and, and do a lot of underwater work. Um, but uh, not everybody gets to do all that fun stuff. But, um, we also have a couple of few affiliates, uh, Integrity Kikosing Pipeline Services. Um, I think they're in West Virginia working right now, putting in some pipeline. but. Uh, they're just a sub for a gas line, a gas companies putting in compressor stations um, and pipelines. Um, McGraw Cocosing, they're kind of kind of close to integ 
or not integrity, um, the industrial division. I think they do more plant maintenance and modification. So, you know, uh, industrial will go build the plant, but the um, way I understand it, McGraw goes in, if there's a plant already, they want to add some new machines or do some modifications, that they will go in there and do that. Uh, other affiliates, we have Cortica Cozing, uh, commercial and uh, industrial construction. Um, they operate on a different uh, basis. You know, highway construction or industrial, they'll, um, they'll They'll let a project with parameters that will bid the project and lowest bidder gets it. These guys operate on a different, I mean, they, they, whoever owns the project, it's, it's a private investment. And, you know, it, they'll take bids, but just because they're the lowest doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's, it's based on who they like. Uh, so it's a little bit different, um, different world for those guys. Um, and then, of course, we have OLEA and area aggregates uh, and Gacosi materials. Um, all Ohio companies, um, with, which that those are companies that Kokosin's bought out um, that um, that help them be uh, helps them uh, compete better in the Ohio market. You know, if you're able to, and especially with the paving jobs, you know, if you have your own materials, then you don't have to. You're not subject to somebody else giving you a quote for a high quote material price. So, um, so that's that's all our affiliates. Um, Talk about a couple projects that I've been on. Um, first, I'll tell you, I mean, any of you guys interested, I know, I know there's a lot of civils in here, but there's, uh, you know, civils a broad degree. You can go into design, uh, you can go into construction. There's multiple things you can go into. How many of you guys are interested in construction? So we got a few construction guys in here. Um, I will say that I may be a little biased, but I think you picked a good degree. Like I said, it's, it's real broad, and you know, you, I, you hear a lot of uh, civil engineers going into the oil and gas, working for oil and gas or other industries, but you don't hear a lot of petroleum engineers coming into construction and working for bridges. So it's uh, it's it's very verse. But um, I don't know a whole, a whole lot about design as other in industries, but I can't talk about construction. Uh, to give you an idea of what you what you would do as a startup uh, project engineer or a field engineer, um, you take quantities. Uh, Look, uh, track time cards, uh, review plans. Um, you, as you get more and more comfortable with plan sets, you'd, we'd, you would start going over plans with foremen and making sure they understand what's going on. Um, tracking production rates, making sure we're still making money. Um, that's that's a big key within the company. You know, you, it's one thing to go build something, but you got to do it productively to make money. Um, so you're you're making sure you're staying on track. Um, Obviously, at least within our company, there's a big issue. There's a big uh, uh, focus on safety. Um, so there's a lot of safety programs that we do, and that involves engineers as well, making sure that the people out there are being safe. Um, so essentially, what you, you're just managing your own little private company is the best way I can explain it. You know, you, you have all these pro we have projects everywhere, um, and you've got a team of people on the project. You'll have your project manager superintendents, engineers, and you're, you're all part of a team that helps manage that project to get a project done productive and safe. Um, so that, that's essentially what you do. Um, and this is uh, the first project I was on. Um, this was a design bid build project. Anybody have any idea what that means? Pretty self-explanatory. So yeah, so what happens is what does it, the, the state lets uh, generally two different types of projects. They either let a design build project or a design bid build project. What happens with the design bid build project, the state solicits some designers, they design the project, and then they bid the project with a set of plans the designer developed. Um, we take those, those plans, we figure out what we think it would cost us to build it, and we bid it and we build it. Um, that's the plans that we have. In the design build, the state releases a uh, uh, RFP request for proposal. Basically, it's just a Word document that tells us uh, certain parameters that we have to abide by to build the project. It gives you a lot more um, chances to do what you want to do. Um, so, with that RFP, we go we go solicit a designer and work with that designer together to design the project and build it. Um, so, it's a little bit different. Um, two different ways to build the project: design, build. Uh, in my opinion, is more of a headache for the contractor. Um, but there's more upside, um, and it gets the project done a lot faster. Design, bid, build uh, will take takes a quite a bit 
while longer to get the project done from beginning to end. Um, anyway, this project was in St. Albans Nitro, West Virginia. Uh, it's a new bridge structure um, on existing piers. Uh, it was $23 million project, $24 million. Uh, took us about a year to build it. Um, this bridge, we had to, I wasn't there for the whole project, but they had to demo the, I shouldn't say it was complete, um, bridge replacement. Where's the laser head on this thing, Greg? Um, you can see here, uh, this is the existing pier. We rehabbed the existing pier, put a new face on it, and uh, this this is an innovative idea that Kikosian came up with. You, know, you had to take the pier cap off and change the height so you can set the beams because we had a lot deeper beams. Um, instead of putting a bunch of guys up there with jackhammers, um, which would have been unsafe, um, they, I don't remember if it was Ryan Jones or who came up with this idea, but they put a little mini hoe up here with a hoe ram on it and decided to peck on it that way, um, which is a lot safer. I, I, I don't know if it was more cost productive. Probably cost more to do it that way. Um, but the, I think the biggest issue here was we were worried about safety. Um, so I'm sure that guy in that excavator wasn't takes a takes a pretty big man to do that. If, but setting an excavator that high up, but um, but it, it worked out well for us. Um, one of the, I think the most interesting about this project was the, the 3.8 million pounds of structural steel um, and what we had to do to get this, this project done in, in the time we had. Um, uh, before we get to that, uh, as soon as I got to Kikosin, they, they gave me a, uh, a little mini project on the side. Anybody know what kind of wall this is by chance? This is a uh, MSC wall, mechanically stabilized earth. Um, the reason this wall type was used here is because, uh, let me go to the next picture. Well, you can see these are all sections of concrete. This would be one section. Um, let's see, that, there's another section. So it's not all poured at once. It's actually like putting a puzzle together. Um, this is the top of it as we're building it. Um, so th this bridge had a really tight approach. And to get up to the get the bridge up to where the elevation we needed to, it had to climb real fast. There's a football, uh, St. Albans football is on this side, and there's a dealership on this side. And I think by the time this wall was done, we were th we were within two to three feet of the corner of that wall up there. So it was real tight area. Um, but you know, with your other like Solnell walls and stuff, you got to have large tiebacks to hold that wall up. So you got to go way back and get a lot of. Um, real estate to, to put that wall up. These MSC walls, the only thing holding up these panels are these aluminum straps. And they range from 18 to 12 feet long. Um, and what's holding that wall up, you see these, these straps are bolted to these anchors that are, are pour, that are poured into the concrete when the wall is precast at the manufacturer. These walls came in this way um, from, uh, I don't remember who we bought them from, but um, uh, so we, we set these pieces of wall and we run these straps back and the sand actually will build it. Once we get all these, this level of straps up, we'll, uh, you can see here this loader's getting sand right now. He's going to dump sand and they'll roll it. And that's actually what's holding that uh, wall up. You, the sand acts as like a, um, almost like sandpaper you can imagine. It just lays on top of it and just compacts those aluminum, aluminum straps down. And you can see here real close there's, there's actually um, raised sections on those straps. So. Thought one of the guys, I don't know if this is true or not, one of the guys in Fredericktown said when these things first came out, they took one of these and, and buried it in the ground and um, strapped a truck to it. Now, whether this is true, I don't know, but he said they tried to pull it out with the truck and couldn't pull it out. So it's interesting how, um, how, that, how that works. Um, but yeah, to give you an idea of what I had to do, I had to, each one of these panels is specific to where it goes. So you, and with a time sensitive project, if you're missing one panel, so you were missing that panel. You couldn't go up with the next row, which is a big deal because we had that million dollar incentive to get the project done. Um, so every time a truck came in, I had to make sure we had all the right panels, make sure the guys were putting the panels in the right place. Um, we had a couple issues with a panel that cracked. Um, we had one panel that was missing, but essentially, I, you know, I had a um, it was a job in itself, just making sure we had keeping this going so we could get so we could get up to here to finish the superstructure. Um, um, so this is the, the, the actual steel superstructure and bridge. Those girders are 11 and a half feet deep. 
they're uh, they were not small girders. A uh, couple of things with this, other things with this project. This is the uh, uh, Kanawha River. A lot, a lot of barge traffic, so we couldn't just go out there and pier, build a causeway to get out here to set cranes on. We had to um, work during the day and then get out of the way for barge traffic to get back through. Um, so we put our cranes on barges, our man lifts on barges, and we, we would put them out there. And then when we got done at the end of the day, or if a barge was coming through that was scheduled, we'd get out of their way and let them come through. Um, so that in itself made the project a little more difficult. Uh, and then again, to, to keep this cause, or keep this, this travel lane open for the barge traffic, um, there's this huge span here. Um, and to get across there, we had to work with the designer to develop this. This is an a, what we call an A-frame. And what that let us do, um, when we got this frame on here, we could set these beams and start counter leaving these beams out. Um, and that frame held it up to a certain distance. Um, so that's what, that's what you see us doing there. We're putting our cantilevers out. Um, so we did that from, we worked from this end to end, got our cantilevers out, and then we stopped and went over here and started working our cantilevers over. Um, so now you go put your, put your center section in. Um, Anybody have an idea what happens or what happened? But when we tried to drop it in, what do you think happened to us? Give you a clue. What happens to steel when it gets hot? Expands. So when we tried to, uh, I don't know if you guys, if you guys seen that picture of the, the the bridge that they're building and they try to build it from one end to the other and it it's offset from each other. You kind of we were standing, we kind of had one of those moments. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we have surveyors and you know designers that, that look at all this stuff, so we we fairly confident it was going to work, but not when the temperature was 98 degrees during the day. Um, so we went to go set that center section there; it wouldn't fit. We were off by, I think, maybe a couple inches or something. Um, we had to get it in there. So anybody have any idea what we did to get that beam to fit? Yeah, that's what we did. They actually turned it sideways and ducked it down the water, picked it back up, and it, it went right in, which is interesting. But yeah, that's that, and that's part of being um, part of what you do as a, a project engineer, or project manager, construction. Yeah, every day you you know some of the guys joke you're you're a firefighter, you're putting out fires. Every day if something's going on. You know, what I mean, if something goes wrong, you gotta you gotta be quick on your feet, think of a way to to solve the problem and keep the project going. That's engineering. You're solving problems. Um, and, and I mean, you guys will find if some of you guys go into construction, you'll get to route some of these guys. It, it experience is uh, number one. Those guys that have experience know what they're talking about, um, and you can learn a lot from those guys. So you're not going to be out there on your own. You're, you're going to be out there, and you're going to learn. And um, you're bringing out a lot of great people in the construction industry. At least that's what, what I've found. Um, and this is just a picture of after the. The deck's on, a stay in place decking um, that they're putting on before we do our, our deck pour. Um, I just like the picture because of the crane, but I like cranes. Uh, and this is when we're done. Uh, they actually had a, uh, once the bridge was done, the city of St. Albans and Nitro had a, uh, what do they call it when they put cane in the back of cars, uh, trunk or treat. Had the kids come up. So, that, so it's also fun to get a project done. You know, you stand back, you build something, say, hey, this is pretty cool, and, and watch the people enjoy it. So that's, that's part of the enjoyment of what we do as well. Uh, another project I did, I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, this was a design build. So this is what I was talking about earlier, where they gave us a, a scope, and we could change and do whatever we, we wanted within that confined space of, that the RFP uh, constricted us to. Um, this was an $18 million project. Same duration. Um, it had 86 expansion joints, um, 31,000 square yards of deck overlay. Um, one of the things about this project, it had a, a, a really high uh, lane penalty, $417 per minute per lane. So there was three lanes uh, in downtown Charleston. If we went out, I think we could only work from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, on weekdays and 8 p.m. to 10 a.m. on uh, Weekends, if we were a minute over, every minute we were over, we paid $417 a minute. Um, we got through that without any lane penalties, which was uh, which was a plus. Um, one of the key things for us with this project, um, 
was a contraflow traffic pattern, which I'll show you. Um, so you either had to work in those lanes, you had to either do the work in that lane um, closure and the, and the hours I just mentioned, or you had to fire, find another way to do the project. Um, so we, we decided to go with this contraflow, which is the opposite way, another way to do the project. Um, how, many, did you, how many of you guys drove through Charleston last year? Didn't even know anything about the contraflow. Did you like it? You disliked it? It was good? All right. You're just saying that because I'm here. How do you? Uh, there we go. This is a, a video that um, the state developed to help people understand what the contraflow was. Uh, I mean, every, everything you do has to probably had some problems. You had some bot loads to get stuck. People might want to do the first time back and things got to I think it worked out okay. So this is where we took traffic and split it on eastbound. Um, you know, you come in with a mill, this is a mill, you take off the top uh, half inch of, of deck and you come back in with a hydro machine which shoots water jets on the deck and creates uh, pockets to do your overlay. Um, and that overlay is just a latex modified concrete that comes back down and just puts a whole new surface on the bridge deck, um, which is, you do a lot of overlay projects in West Virginia. This, a little bit different about this project is it had a uh, the rebar in this bridge deck was um, black bar, um, so it uh, most bridge decks were epoxy, keep it from corroding. This one didn't have epoxy bar in it, so they had a cathodic protection system um, that supplied a, a small charge to the rebar to keep it from corroding. Um, so that's what this was, and that, that's another reason we went to the, because it takes more time to do that, so that's another reason we did the contraflow. Two minutes, all right. Skip that, that's the expansion joint, one of the 86 we had to do. Uh, all right, last slide. Professional advice. I guess um, I, I do this because I go to career fairs at WU all the time, and I, it, it's almost unbelievable um, the things you see in here. Um, I think right now, you guys, the most important thing is keep a good GPA. I, I, I'm a firm believer that GPA is not how smart you are, it's how hard you're willing to work. Um, you know, put your Xbox down, skip a football game. Do what you got to do to keep a good GPA. Because you, when you come to me and hand me a resume at a career fair, if I see anything below a 3.0, I'm thinking, I'm wondering how 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 hard is your work ethic? I mean, also, I, I mean, I understand there's there's situations. So I'll ask questions to find out 
what happened or if there's a reason that you have a lower GPA. Um, but I, I, I'm a firm believer it's, it's on how hard you're willing to work. It's not how smart you are. I mean, somebody that's smart you may come to them faster, but you may have to put in an extra two hours, but that shows that you're willing to work hard. And when you come to work for us, you're going to do the same thing. Um, get involved outside of class. Anything you do outside of class shows, again, that you're, that you're a hard worker. Um, and then get experience. Um, it's, sometimes it's uh, not what you know, it's who you know. Um, so if you get the chance to meet somebody that's in construction or, or, or if you want to go in design or whatever you want to do, if you get the chance to meet somebody and talk to them, get their number, get their card. I'll give you a real quick story before I let you guys go. Um, the reason that, that how I got hired on with Kokosi uh, Construction Company, I was hired with Turner in D.C. first. And then um, I, I had worked at a DOH project my freshman year at Wesley, and I, I met a guy named Bryce Burgett. Didn't know who he was, got his card. Um, talked to him a little bit. So I, I accepted the offer to Turner. Didn't really want to go to D.C. I'm uh, more of a country guy. And uh, I was talking to somebody and said, do, do you not know people? Um, that he worked for in the past or cards or anything. I said, well, then it hit me that I had this guy's card from Kokosi. So I shot him an email. It turns out he's the son of the owner of the company. Um, and he got me an interview with the guys in Charleston, which got me the job at Kokosi. So it's not, a lot of times it's not what your GPA is or who you, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, so get out there, shake hands, meet people. Um, it's a competitive market out there for you guys. So what you do now matters. Um, I'll end it with that. I don't know if anybody has any anybody questions. questions for Dickie? You guys are ready to go? Yeah. I am too. Right. Enjoy your turkey. We will see you when you get back.